Welcome back. And again, I am playing the role of Bell, human Bell, inviting people who want to join us to find their seat. Because we are now entering this strange thing called moment prisons, right, Lou? Yeah. And for me, this is a novel concept, and it kind of feels like the direct opposite of mindfulness. Like getting caught in this moment you can't escape, like being hostage of time or like completely unable to move and let go and move on. And that's where we end up when we obsess over technicalities, definitions and semantics, caught in the theoretical realm instead of being in the practical world, solving problems for and with people and I mean, we've already heard a bit about it. Nick pointed it out yesterday afternoon. I think this is the crowd who quite enjoys these moment prisons, to be quite honest, that there's a, there's a curiosity about semantics. Because, but it, it's not always that it, it helps us progress. And it's certainly something to avoid. And Louis is here to tell us how. King of UX, author, founder, and one of the forefathers of information architecture. We are so lucky to have Lou with us today. Please give him a very warm welcome. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Well, thank you so much. And that was very brave to try to kind of work through the moment prisons part. I'm still figuring out myself. So I hope we got that on recording somehow. I'll go back to it. Anyway, thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's my first time in Vienna. And I've been wanting to go to the Intersection Conference for, well, pretty much since they started, since I heard about it. I love things in intersections, including, of course, all of you. But I want to actually give a special shout out before we get started, because it could slip through the cracks when the conference ends, it happens. I want us to give a round of applause for Milan and Wolfgang and everyone who's been involved in this conference really quickly. People who do this kind of work are the heroes of the field, whatever field that is. And let's get into fields. That's kind of what this talk's about. So I'm going to introduce myself really quickly. Uh, my story is coming from a background in information science and librarianship in the late 80s, where I was teaching people how to create information uh, for Gopher, if anybody remembers Gopher before the web. Yes, all right, we got a couple of people. I was a Gopher master. You've heard of webmasters. There were such a thing called gopher masters. And um, I was also an instructor at the University of Michigan in the United States. Uh, but I uh, got half my PhD and fled for the business world, started an information architecture consulting agency called Argus that was around for a number of years, uh, went solo for a number of years. In that time, uh, co-authored information architecture for the World Wide Web. Uh, which is now in its fourth edition uh, with Peter Morville and Jorge Arango. Um, I liked, I didn't, I won't say I like writing books, I like being involved in writing books. Uh, so I'd rather have somebody else do that for me. And so now I'm a publisher. Uh, we've done about 60-ish uh, books and we also put on four conferences a year, all on user experience design. So I made the transition kind of a normal one, uh, abandoning one uh, tribe, if you will, IA, for another that was emerging UX. And uh, so that's me, moving around quite a bit. But I'm, oh, and also, uh, those books that are out in the, the room just before the, you enter this area of the conference, uh, those are books, uh, a sample of our books that are for sale. Uh, you're welcome to look at them, even if you don't, you don't, you're not obligated to buy them. I know we're going to be giving some away uh, before the conference is done. Okay, so I want to talk about you. Now, I asked Milan, who's going to be here? What are their job titles? Give me a sense of the audience. And he gave me this idea here. He gave me a list of titles. And it's really quite an interesting list. Uh, some things I'd never heard of, like employee experience designer, although that's not surprising. We'll probably start hearing more and more of that. Some terms I've certainly heard before, but are mysterious to me, like process engineer. And some are very traditional, like HR professional. 
Um, and it's really kind of a testament to you that you are here. Because most people, if they get to go to a conference, they stay in their lane. So if I'm an HR person, if I have budget to go to a conference, I'm probably going to the HR professionals conference, not this weird thing called intersection. And yet here you are. So I take my hat off to you. Somehow you managed to find your way here. Maybe this is on your own uh, budget. Maybe you paid out of pocket. Either way, you're interested in something more than your home field, than your home tribe. You're also here because enterprise designer is kind of a, a, a cool term that's being really advocated here at this conference. And it's kind of having a moment right now. Enterprise design is this thing that people are excited by. Maybe the reason you're here is that you've been an HR professional or a business process engineer or something else for years and years, but those things don't speak to you any longer or not enough, or you're bored, or you want to get some new ideas, and you found this place, and you found each other, and you found a term, enterprise designer. That's great. And this moment is really exciting because when you come together and with a term and people who also have found it, there's a number of things that you can get that you can't get anywhere else, knowledge, identity, and community. So let's take those, uh, let's pull those apart a little bit. Knowledge, you may be familiar with the thousands of years old fable of the blind men and the elephant. Anybody familiar with that? So I'll run through it really quickly. It's the normal story. There's a bunch of blind men out for a walk together in the jungle. They're all blind, that doesn't seem very safe. And they come across an elephant. One of them touches the trunk and says, oh, I found a snake. Another one touches a leg and says, no, 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 it's not a snake, it's a tree, and so on. And until they take their evidence, have a conversation about it, synthesize it, until that happens, they don't achieve the insight of knowing that it's an elephant. You're the blind men. All those job titles, all those disciplines represented on the last slide come together for new insight, new knowledge. Identity, just this feeling of knowing that you're not the only one. Now, you are all probably the only one in your organization, unless you're from Montreal, because it seems like everyone in Montreal is an enterprise designer these days. Montreal notwithstanding, you probably are kind of lonely. And when you find other people, you may have to go all the way to Vienna to find them. Man, what a great feeling. You're not the only one. It's a sort of sad take on misery loves company. That lonely feeling gets to go away maybe once a year. So good for you, you found each other. And then obviously when you find each other and share an identity that leads to some sense of community, in effect, you right now are at the best party possible on this planet for enterprise designers. This is a great time. And I get the sense you are having a good time here. Now, what powers all this goodness, all the, this coming together, this finding each other, this sharing of knowledge, this achieving of insight? It's language. So language gets us the knowledge, because we can have conversations, we can do that synthesis. Language helps us call ourselves something, enterprise designer or whatever. Language helps us bring all these things together and share with each other as a community. Specifically, definitions and metaphors. When you are trying to map out a new space, like a new practice, for example, you need these things. These are your bread and butter. These are the things that help you make sense of the unknown. But, as you can tell, uh, it has something to do with prison. These, this is my sad attempt to um, digitally draw the bars of a prison. 
and the kind of prison I worry about for you and for all of us in all these new fields that we work in are moment prisons. What's a moment prison? It's a moment in time that is so good and wonderful that nobody wants to let go of it. And by extension, we build walls around these ideas to the point where the ideas become negative. They may even become harmful. They certainly lose value. But we keep building those towers higher and higher. We keep piling up bricks higher and higher. That's my definition of a moment prison. It's something that was good and is no longer good, but you're, you're sticking yourself in there and you won't let the world in. So uh, with apologies to Gartner, here's the language hype cycle I whipped up the other night. Um, there's a language trigger, this idea that there's something my home discipline, in this case, doesn't cover. And maybe somewhere, somewhere else, other people might have something to do to help me with it. And it, it rises, people get excited by it, they think it's going to be the next big thing, they get inflated expectations, and then it stops working and starts sinking to the point that it has negative value. It's actually harmful, and that's the region of the misery of moment prisons. And I think that's what I want to caution you about with enterprise design. You are on a journey as enterprise designers. I don't know exactly where you are. I suspect you're on the way up right now, and that's a great feeling. But be advised that when you reach that peak, the drop-off is steep and quick. And if you're not looking for it, you'll start building a prison around yourself. So let's dig in a little bit. Definitions are problematic. I think we all know that, but we don't always practice that. Uh, I'm going to tell you my personal experience with the problems with definitions. So when we wrote this book, people call it the polar bear book, the information architecture book. It's got a bear on it because O'Reilly books all have woodcuts of animals. And um, I didn't choose it. I'm really glad it's a polar bear and not a banana slug because they have one of those. Um, the polar bear book came out in 98. It sold, I actually just got the numbers, it sold 183,000 copies. That's crazy. I'm a publisher. I wish one of my books would do that well. Um, why did it sell so well? It's not that great a book. It's a good book. Well, because of the timing of the moment was that there were many people from different established professions who were trying to understand information in the context of the explosion of the web. And our book basically took a lot of library science, a little bit of usability engineering, a little bit of other stuff that me and Peter picked up in grad school and so forth, and put it together and gave people a bunch of terms, a, a language, if you will, some concepts, and, a, and we, use, we took information architecture as a term because we thought it was a good one. And it kind of did a lot of the, the heavy lifting to popularize the term information architecture. Uh, we, if you're wondering, if you're a Zachman information architect on this end, or a Worman information architect on that end of the spectrum, we're probably right around here. So we write this book, and I tell you, it's crazy. I would, like, I would go to uh, a consulting engagement. Uh, I, I was so excited. Wow, I get to go to Silicon Valley and consult for big tech company X. And it wasn't X, like just some company. <laughs> um, and I like, meet people, and someone said, oh, you're Lou Rosenfeld? Yeah. And she comes over, and she gives me a hug. I, I, like, Whoa, why? Well, you wrote that book, and now I know what I am. Thank you. Jeez, that's great. I'm just flying. I'm just flying. And we start putting together a community and conferences and all the sort of thing that you would expect. But by the next year, we were already seeing arguments. People saying, well, IA, we love it. We're all IA people. It's great. But there's a, well, some of us think there's something called big IA. 
Big IA is like, goes broader, it covers a lot of the UI, it covers a lot of the way people interact. Uh, it's like, you know, it's not just having choices for menus, it's how to design the menus. And there are other people who would say, but we don't even do little IA well, which is metadata and taxonomies and navigation systems and search systems, et cetera, et cetera. And they would argue and argue and argue and argue until the point where people hated each other. They fought. It was like Mac versus PC. It was really terrible. And friendships actually broke up over this division. It's silly. Long story short, a lot of the, uh, the people who um, believed in Big IA became interaction designers, and they started an interaction design association, and they were very ascendant for a while. And, but, you know, it's, we were all building moment prisons around the term information architecture, and it was a problem. Now, information architecture since then sort of took it on the chin. I mean, this is... Information architect is a job, uh, you know, the job title, basically, the role. Uh, according to Google Trends, it ain't doing so hot. And I'm sure it was doing a lot better even before 2004, which is as far back as they go. And I just mentioned that the interaction designers were ascendant, but you know what? They're not doing so well either. These terms seem to have gotten stale. And if you're in my world of UX, we're all threatened by these guys. Oh, no, they're going to put us out of work, the product designers. Um, isn't that terrible? You know, now we have to either change what we call ourselves or reframe everything or, or just retire. I mean, it's insane. We're so, like, passionate about these terms. For what? I have to tell you, by the way, I searched for enterprise design. I don't really believe this, but that's what I got, which makes me always a bit more distrustful of Google, but that's a whole nother presentation. So, should you feel bad about this? I, I like Kenneth Bowles, and he always has good things to say. And He says, when a job becomes an identity, you are in serious trouble. He's talking about a moment prison. There's a lot of these things that I want to encourage you to be really cautious about. A lot of these things that you can get caught up in, like not just your job title, which, by the way, does not describe your value as a professional. It does not. Your portfolio is a snapshot, a moment that may describe your work, but how well? What about a resume? That's a kind of problematic little snapshot. A job posting, an RFP, a degree, all these things are little artifacts, they're little moments, and they can be prisons. Okay, so my advice is to be careful about how you define yourself, and instead, focus a bit more on asking the question, are terms like this helping me, or are they hurting me? And. Uh, these terms are always in flux. Some of them have been around for a long time and are still good. They work. Uh, some are flashes in the pan. Some are, um, by the time you hear about them, they may already be dated. It's hard to know. And when you choose a term like this to define yourself, you really have to do it with caution and you have to do it over time. Again, it might be good today, it might be great today. Tomorrow, maybe not. You know, there's a, uh, the, the concept of the metronome. I like to think of there being metronomes of life. For me, a metronome of life might be going to the dentist once a year. Another maybe metronome of life should be asking yourself, am I working with the right label? the right definition of who I am and what I do. I, I would do that once a year, maybe while you're sitting in the chair at the dentist and wondering what else to think about. Okay, I want to also move from definitions to metaphors. Uh, this is a visual metaphor, by the way, of the United States. 
It's Uncle Sam. And I love this cartoon because it's from, I think it's 1899. And the United States had just defeated Spain in the uh, Spanish-American War. And we had just arrived on the scene with all you Europeans as an imperial colonizing power. We had Cuba, we had Puerto Rico, we had the Philippines. And even then, American commentators were seeing the United States and Uncle Sam as uh, a bloviating uh, glutton for power. And this is 124 years ago. But what do we see, at least in the States, as Uncle Sam? It's still this live, simple, hard work and playing guy from 1861. So these things can break down pretty easily. Metaphors are problematic. Anyone remember Alta Vista? Portal. Remember that word portal? Oh, it's a great word. Ah, portals. Um, I once was an expert witness on a case. It was a $17 million case that, had, that turned on what and how you define a portal. Crazy crazy case. Wait, but that's a portal. Isn't this a portal? SharePoint, your favorite tool, right? Is this a portal? No, it's not a portal. <laughs> Sorry, I just like to throw that in. Um, portal, what the hell is a portal? Now, eventually, we stop using metaphors, but it's almost always when it's way, way, way too late. There's a number of metaphors that often show up on lists of terms that really are the most annoying buzzwords of whatever the moment is. And you've seen a bunch of these, like MVP, design thinking, disruption, dashboard. How many of you have been asked to design a dashboard? Probably a lot of the same people who were a few years earlier asked to design a portal. What's a portal? I don't know. What's a dashboard? Can you explain it? But we get asked to do these things. We get asked to do these things by people who may not have even done any diagnostics in terms of figuring out what the problem is. And they're already coming to us with these things as solutions. So I'd like you just as you do with definitions, to be careful with metaphors that you use in your professional work. I don't know what the metaphors around enterprise design are. I'm sure there will be some, and I encourage you to use caution. So what can you do? You should ban words, right? Well, no, you should. Ban words as an exercise, not a public policy action. So by this I mean um, portal. What I found when I was consulting was when a client said to me at a meeting, we're going to build, we want to build a portal. And I'm like, well, didn't they hire me to help them figure out what they want to build? Uh, what I would do is I would ban a term like portal. I'd literally say to my client, I said, anyone on, on your team who uses the word portal during our meetings, has to throw a dollar on the table, and if I use it, I got, well, I got to throw $10 on the table. Don't use the word portal. Somebody used the term mask yesterday. This metaphor was a mask for the, the, the solving, the identifying of the problem. And when you ban a metaphor like this, it forces people to actually think about what's going on in real language. It doesn't allow them to skip ahead, to skip the process of diagnostics to the solution, which is often the wrong one. What words could you, would you love to ban that you are working with today? I wish we had more time, because I'd like to hear them. But I want you to at least ask yourself that question. Also, another thing you can do, spread the semantic load. What does that mean? When we take we put so much importance in single terms, like a definition or a metaphor. What we do is we make them overly important. We make them too important, 
And so there's too much pressure on them. They have too much meaning. And ultimately, they they are supposed to have more value than they really can bring to these conversations. So that's why I think it's important, and I appreciate what the intersection group is doing with EDGY, because they are de-emphasizing the words, the definitions and metaphors in favor of language. They're spreading the work over many words rather than a few choice words. They also loosely draw what they're doing. It's not like, you know, a uh, rigid set of terminology. It's loose enough that it works for many people with many backgrounds. It's really a pigeon. And finally, uh, taking a light touch. In other words, don't take this stuff too seriously. It needs to be flexible, it needs to change. And if you take yourself seriously and you take the language seriously, you're gonna be finding yourself unable to step back and look at yourself critically and look at the language that you and your colleagues are using critically. I also uh, encourage you to focus on processes over artifacts. So um, Nick Toon, I just grabbed this yesterday, as you can tell, is in this room. His head is, was sort of in the lower right. I'm sorry, Nick, I cut your head off. But he was talking about collaborative modeling. And uh, you know, great, I'm sure it's a great process. It's one of many. There's many processes out there that involve people in groups talking through ideas. And he cautioned, rightly so, avoid focusing on the artifacts. Just because you did this exercise one time doesn't mean you're done. It's one of those, another take on the point isn't the destination, it's the journey. Uh, I find, and you may find, that looking at a conference program is actually a better way to do definition. So if you look at, if you want to define enterprise design, look at the program for the Enterprise Design Conference, where we are today. If you really want to understand enterprise design, look at the first program and how that's different from the second program, and so on and so on. And you will get the historic perspective over time of what this field is and probably where it's going. You will start seeing the trends of what enterprise design will be as well as what it has been. I do something similar when I look at the books we've published. When we started off, a lot of them were how-to books on very specific UX methods like card sorting and prototyping. And uh, we wouldn't publish books like that today, typically. We publish books that are much more conceptual and go beneath the surface of the UI. So, to close, you want sustainable enterprises, you got to practice sustainable conversations, the ones that happen at intersections like this. Three things to remember. Pursue vigilance and self-questioning about how you use the language of your work. Choose processes over artifacts, like defining over definition, and let it play out over time. Time is on your side if you pay attention to it if you do, you'll stop yourself from building moment prisons. Thank you very much. Beautiful. What are we banning? Any examples of words we're banning? Because I think we have time for one question and maybe some examples. So if anybody has something to share? Please. Budgets. budgets. Boo, budgets. Add that to the list. Well, anything, anyone else? Which one? New ways of working. New ways of working. Yuck. New ways of working. Theory. Theory. <laughs> Comes with its limitations. Yeah? Best practice. Best practice. Yep. What the hell is that? Anyone else? Product what? Product yes, exactly. Exactly. K KPIs? Yes. Whoa. And OKRs now, right? 
Any other abbreviations you want to get rid of? We could go on. <laughs> and we will. So uh, with that, I thank you, Lou, for a beautiful presentation. Big round of applause. Thank you.